I think the first news release, if you will, that I worked with, I might have been on you know some some online publication, was for our carbon nanotube uh, reinforced or carbon nanotube filled material for ESD or electrical properties, and I kind of expected that to get some a bump in. Um, notice that people would notice it and say hey that's cool i don't need that particularly that's kind of neat i don't really need it but if he can make carbon nanotube filled material his um nylons are probably pretty good too they bring some some uh, uh you know some benefit for, for our other products turned out i it's it was the only thing that people cared about hello there internet my name is adam fosnott I'm a mechanical engineer and I've been working with 3D printers of all shapes and sizes for over 7 years. I've worked with machines from under $200 to over $200,000 and I have learned so much in the process. One thing I noticed is that a 3D printer tends to be judged on two extremes, one being a press release where everything is shiny and perfect, and the other being a YouTube review where a lot of times every product gets criticized. Another insight is that there tend to be two worlds in 3D printing one being the industrial space and the other the hobby space, and those two worlds rarely talk to each other. This podcast breaks down those barriers to have a transparent, no BS conversation about the world of 3D printing and technology. I'm so happy to have you on board. Let's get started. Thank you so much for, uh, for taking some time to, to meet with me. Uh, if you could just kick things off and introduce yourself and 3DX Tech. Sure. Yeah, my name is Matt Howlett, and I'm the founder of 3DX Tech. We're a a filament supplier out of Michigan. Uh, We've recently launched a a high-temp 3D printer, uh, the Gearbox HT2. Um, So overall, the the business, um, we're now into filaments, uh, printers, and we have a a pretty thriving parts business, too. So it's kind of those uh, three three prongs of our our strategy. Awesome. Yeah, three areas that I think are are pretty common and well established for 3D printing companies. Um, how long ago did 3DX Tech start? So it's kind of the uh, it's kind of the long story. Is so I started the business in 2014, literally in my basement. Okay. Um, yeah. So I'd, I'd seen filament printers for many years prior to, um, and basically in 2013, 14 timeframe. I interviewed several different uh, filament manufacturers to see which one I, you know, kind of meshed minds with and uh, came up with this one who's good folks and sent them some of my specialty formulations to convert into filament just to kind of validate whether or not the market uh, would be interested in high performance or higher performance materials than what we're currently in the space. And then within a year or so, we moved out of the basement to a thousand square foot place. Um, Two years later, or a year later, went to 6,000 square foot place. Two years ago, we took over this building. We bought this building at 68,000 square feet. Um, So we've got 25,000 square feet right now dedicated to filament production, 18,000 for printing, and um, 25,000 for the manufacturer of the printer. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. So and then, it's been an interesting journey since 2014, for sure. Yeah, when you think about that level of expansion, that's not a lot of time in between kind of starting <laughs> and such a large footprint now. Um, but I want to go back to those those first rolls of filament. What what inspired you to to kind of start this up in your basement, and what were these special formulations? Um. It's kind of so. So my background, I've I've, I've been in the uh, plastics chemical industry for probably about 27 years. It was always on the uh, resin side of the business or specialty additives. So resin companies like Solve, DSM, Bayer, uh, Monsanto um, are the resin side of where I came from, and then specialty on the additives. Um, Zoltec Torre on the carbon fiber. I was a thermoplastics manager. And then prior to that, a big uh, Belgian chemical or a carbon nanotube company, uh, Nanocell. And so basically when I, when I started this business, um, I wanted to try to leverage some of that experience in whether it be carbon fiber, carbon nanotube, some of the specialty uh, materials to see if, you know, what I was, you know, kind of good at, if the market would be uh, receptive to it. So I, I really didn't start it to do 
blue PLA or red ABS. I mean, we sell plenty of both, but the whole goal was to kind of get involved in some of those cool applications that we were doing when I was selling materials into the injection molding or extrusion market. Gotcha. So you had a, a wealth of experience in high performance plastics. Is that fair to yeah. say oh, before yeah. you started? Yeah. Okay. Um, in that market, were you mostly in the sales end or were you in the kind of development side of the, of the carbon? On the carbon side? Yeah. Yeah, so um, when I worked there, um, I was responsible for their thermoplastics composites business. So if okay. our carbon fiber went into thermoplastics, that was kind of my wheelhouse. So it was either the chopped thermoplastics or milled, if you will, that can go into uh, pellets that people could injection mold or make filament out of. Uh, but we were also involved in tapes and sheet uh, for, um, for some of the you know, more structural composites too. But thermoplastics was... On the, on the in the carbon fiber business was my wheelhouse. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. So then, when you wanted to start making filament, um, you said you found some people to to work with. Yeah. So in that situation, were you handing them, I guess, pellets that you asked them nicely to extrude into <laughs> filament for you? Did you buy an extruder or build one in your basement? What What was that next step? Well, I kind of had a I had an old buddy in the plastics industry that started off a pretty successful business, and he didn't own one extruder. Um, so he he owned the formulations. He kind of knew how to make those. He got specifications written around them, and then he would toll produce the resin, uh, the pellets, the compounding at various places that had capacity. So in many respects, he had infinitely variable capacity, um, and he didn't have the over the fixed overhead that you that a producer would would have. Um, so it's kind of the way I started it, but ran into the fixed capacity issue of, you know, I was bumping into their ability to not only make their own materials, but mine. You know, we, we kind of started to sell relatively quickly, and we kind of got to a point really quick where my demand for my products was, was you know, kind of putting a lot of pressure on their demand for their products on the same equipment. So it made a lot of sense for me to, once I validated that the market would accept our kind of materials, I put in one extruder, then two extruders, three extruders, and, and then ran out of space and put in a bigger building to, to put in more extruders. Um, but yeah, that's that's kind of how it all started. Okay, and then um, where did where did your first sales come from? Did you just kind of like put it on a website? Did you go to a trade show? Um, <laughs> did you kind of network within your your plastics uh, colleagues? How did that happen? Yeah, it was kind of funny. So the even now, for the most part, filament is a creature of the internet. Um, so built a website, uh, put our products on there. I did some LinkedIn and some Facebook and Twitter, and, you know, just your general kind of what you do. Uh, went to a couple trade shows, but by and large, um, the materials, the first, I think the first news release, if you will, that I worked with, I might've been on, you know, some, some online publication was for our carbon nanotube uh, reinforced or carbon nanotube filled material for ESD or electrical properties. And I kind of expected that to get some, a bump in um, notice that people would notice it and say, hey, that's cool. I don't need that particularly, that's kind of neat. I don't really need it, but if he can make carbon nanotube filled material, his um, nylons are probably pretty good too. They bring some, some uh, uh, you know, some benefit for, for our other products. Turned out, I. It's, it was the only thing that people cared about. So I, in my in my carbon nanotube days and in some of the carbon fiber, I would sell to folks uh, polymer. I would sell the plastic or the carbon nanotubes uh, to people like Hitachi, Western Digital, Seagate, um, so that they could make uh, wafer handling devices or um, packaging for, for a lot of the semicon market. And they saw a ESD safe carbon nanotube material um, that they could print prototype parts for or limited production parts, uh, uh, production uh, fixtures and jigs. Um, and all of a sudden, our biggest customers were coming out of Semicon and um, automotive for some fixtures and jigs. Uh, but a whole lot of uh, the specialty stuff just really outstripped anything that we were doing on the normal materials, if you will. Okay, gotcha. Yeah. So really... What it sounds like your your first big win was ESD safe carbon nanotube filament. Is that right? 
Yeah, yeah, I think so. I think, you know, that's what really got a lot of those customers to talk to us. And then kind of went from there. You know, we have um, a kind of a buffet mentality of, of some of our you know products. So ESD, I would get involved with one or two or two or three in the platform so that I would at least have a, a position to to talk to customers about. And then they would come to me and say, hey, yeah, well, we're going into a plasma environment. It has to be high purity or high temperature chemical, what have you. Um, and then we would come up with ESD PVDF or uh, this sounds great, but it really needs to be all 10 because of something. So we ended up having um, a lot of customer driven development where they would come in and say this grade of, of, of ESD X is, um, you know, Palmer X is great. I just need 10 or 20 degrees more in temperature or I need this um, solvent resistance. Um, and then given the materials background, it was pretty straightforward to be able to formulate for that. So, Gotcha. That's awesome. Yeah. And so um, you were able to kind of custom uh, formulate and modify the filament specific for customers. Um, is that something that you guys still do today or is your current line of filaments um, generally useful for your industrial customers? No, it's, it's, I mean, we're always changing it, you know, so this year we'll probably constrict a little bit on a couple of them that were built for one or two customers and just really didn't take off. And then we've got other ones that are in the works right now for some applications that are going to take off and, and kind of maybe supplant those. So it's always kind of changing. We've got some core products that, that seem to be the um, 80% of our business or is, you know, kind of 20% of your products kind of, you, as you could imagine that, that rule applies for us. Um, so we're, we're, Still adding new things. We just added a um, a, a really lightweight polypropylene filament. Uh, okay. Used uh, it uses a um, um, additive that reduces the density even further. So we're in the 0.7s, 0.78 maybe grams per cubic centimeter. Great dimensional stability. It's got an additive that allows it to uh, adhere to water soluble supports, which kind of you know is special for polypropylene, which doesn't like to adhere to much of anything. So right. <laughs> we're still doing new stuff. It's just um, more targeted towards real specific areas. Okay. Using the, the lightweight polypropylene as, as an example, what industry are you expecting to, to need that material the most? That specific. So some of it's just, <laughs> I'm sitting around and I think of a cool material that I either used to sell in automotive and wonder if it'll print or... Um, what you can do, but that specific material um, came from a big drone company that we're doing business with that wanted to build frames uh, of a certain um, air vehicle that they were building. Had to be lightweight, um, had to have a lot of resiliency to it, um, great dimensional stability, and um, relatively easy to print. And so polypropylene and, and you know making it even lighter weight was, was the way I went. And the, the nice thing about some of those materials like polypro or, or um, maybe even polyesters, but definitely polypro, is that if it's going to be out in the environment, it doesn't change properties after exposure to humidity. Uh, as you can imagine, drones are not going to fly around inside of an office too often. And so if your properties are X, you know, you're designing for 2,000 megapascals of whatever, you know, tensile strength, call it, uh, or tensile modulus, then you know, five months in a field somewhere, you really don't want that to change much because everything will change. So polypropylene for that application turned out to be a really good base material to start with. Gotcha. That's awesome. Yeah. I love hearing kind of the 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 inspiration behind the material because uh, to your point, uh, polypropylene, from what I've seen at least, hasn't been super widely adopted when you compare mm -hmm. it to like uh, copolyesters and nylons. Um, but nylons change pretty drastically as they age and yeah. absorb humidity. Hey there, it's Adam. If you're enjoying this video, could you go ahead and tap the like button? It's totally free for you, and through the magic of internet algorithms, it will help more people see the podcast. Thanks. Yeah, we sell. I mean, it's the dirty truth is that we sell a lot of nylon, and I don't use hardly any of it. Really? Um, <laughs> it's, it's, I, it's just is what it is. If, if I've got an application that's going to end up over 100 Celsius, I, I'll probably take a look at nylon. But below, you know, if it's going to be room tempish, um, I'll go with the polyester all the time because it, I, I, it's more predictable in terms of mechanical properties um, after exposure to humidity. Um, so that's just, you know, you know, if our customers want to buy it, I'm 100% down with that. 
Uh, but the, uh, for my taste, if I, I'd like the properties to be a little bit more predictable. And uh, we've got a 30% glass filled nylon that actually satisfies most of that. Once you replace a lot of nylon uh, with glass, it, um, you know, you reduce your moisture absorption and those effects. But in general, yeah, it's, um, you know, uh, the PolyPro worked out pretty good. Um, when one of the things you see, one of, one of the reasons you don't see a lot of polypropylene, even though it's relatively inexpensive, it's kind of changed lately. But um, if you if you take a step back and look at all the materials in the FDM type market, the vast majority of those are amorphous materials. Um, they have lower shrinkage, uh, more predictable um, um, shrinkage, warp lift type. Uh, polypro tends to be, well, it is, it's, it's crystalline. Um, so the higher the crystallinity, the more shrink and warp you get and the more difficulty you get printing. The nylons, most of the nylons you see out there are either very low crystallinity, they're, they're a copolymer uh, that have low crystallinity or anything that's kind of transparent is an amorphous nylon and, and you, you pick that up. But the higher crystallines, you know, like, that's why you don't really see any nylon 6-6 six, six filaments. It's just too crystalline. Um, you know, so... Um, there's some materials that more uh, that better lend themselves to filament-based printing, and they tend more often than not, especially in general-purpose printers, they tend more often than not to be um, on the amorphous side of things. Gotcha. So that's why there isn't more nylon six six. I've noticed that nylon twelve is usually or eleven or twelve is usually kind of like the the starting point for a lot of filaments. Yeah, and then those are you know the. We could do a whole show on nylons, but the um, <laughs> but the uh, but the nylon twelves, for example, that that amide group, if you want to call it, they're polyamides, but that nylon group is twelve carbons away from each other, so it's kind of structurally or chemically more akin to a polyolefin than than or like a polyethylene or polypropylene than it is a, a traditional nylon. So you, you you end up having a little bit lower effect of that. Um, the flip side of those are they're kind of expensive. You know, nylon twelves are just kind of expensive. They're three or four times more expensive than a normal, say, nylon six. Um, but they, they do, we just launched a couple of them in the last few months. They do have some pretty cool properties in terms of lower moisture absorption and a little bit better chemical resistance. Uh, but you pay for it because the base resin is significantly more expensive. Right, right. And everything you're saying is kind of hitting all of the, the nerves in the back of my head <laughs> when I did chemical engineering for a few oh, yeah. years before switching to mechanical. Um, organic chemistry wasn't my strong suit, um, yeah, I, but I, I, I really it. enjoyed it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, actually, that was one of my favorite undergrad classes was uh, organic and, uh, and the polymer chemistry stuff. But, you know, to each own. Yeah, I, I enjoyed it. I just wasn't very good at it. Um, so taking uh, a couple steps back here, uh, your first materials uh, were carbon nanotube filled uh, filaments, nylons. Um, when you started growing from there, what did that process look like? Was one of your first steps to bring it in house? What did your first hires look like? I'm, I'm just so curious how you went from starting with one very unique filament up to where you are today with, you know, so many different materials. So we still, for a number, for a couple of years after we started, we still leveraged um, that one outside supplier's capacity to make uh, materials. But slowly, like I said, we brought in one um, extruder and then two and three. And at the beginning, it was just, uh, I, I operated the extruder and uh, my background's in plastics engineering. Um, and in those resin companies, I started off as a process um, tech service engineer type. So I knew how to run the machines if I, if, you know, so I started off running the machines and then I had a guy winding and packaging and we sold film it and eventually got, had to, you know, um, get somebody to do the packaging and the shipping. And then eventually we just, there wasn't enough time to work, you know, um, on the machine. So um, I had a, a business mentor early on um, kind of tell me um, there was a difference, you know, so you have to decide at some point early on if you're going to work on the business or work in the business. And so at that point, I did decide. So I took a step back and said, OK, I'm going to hire people to replace me on the floor. And then you start working on the organization and then you can look at a lot of the forward facing mechanisms, you know, the sales and marketing and the customer service side. Uh, but, yeah, at about. A year and a half in, I decided to work more on the business than in it. And um, then we, you know, really started to progress a lot faster. 
Gotcha. That's a that's a great insight. I've heard similar quotes before, but not with kind of like the concrete example that you gave of running the machines to doing more high level organizational stuff. Yeah. Um, your your mentor at the time was their advice kind of the the push you needed to to start doing that. And where did you learn um, how to um, organize the business coming from such a a heavy engineering background and a, a tech background. So the, um, yeah, he was, he was, he was a customer of mine and, um, you know, just, I've, I've got a lot of close relationships with a lot of our customers and, um, this guy was just, he's a good guy. I still talk to him now and, um, uh, just had some advice, you know, he, he was a totally dissimilar business. He was actually in, um, what's he doing? He's more on the pet side of things. You know, his business is more in pets, like pet, uh, dog food and uh, okay. pet things, you know what I mean? And we're, we're <laughs> supplying filament to him for some of his pet related um, projects. Uh, but he's a good, solid guy. Um, but yeah, my background working for a lot of these big chemical companies, you know, everything's organizational. And um, for me, it wasn't as hard to try to figure out how to organize things. It's how to stop analyzing things. Um, so a lot of these big companies, you had to have 15 justifications from 26 different managers for 15 different weeks before you could figure out where to go to lunch. Um, gotcha. where, you know, so um, when you're working for a small business, you have to, you know, do a, a whole lot more um, on the, you know, on the fly, if you will, you make sure you make good decisions, um, but make them relatively fast, make sure they're um, um, in line with where you want to go and then, and then decide and do something about it. Um, so in my experience at big companies, I loved all the companies and the people I worked with, but you never got in trouble for saying no. You only got in trouble for saying yes. And um, at a small company, you die if you don't say yes. So it's, gotcha. it's, it's just, it's a different mentality. Yeah. I think that's, that's really strong advice. Um, and having worked at, at a few companies of different sizes, I can definitely relate to a lot of what you're saying there. Um, when you look at your business today, is it mostly hobby customers, industrial customers? Do you prefer serving one over the other? Um, that's two questions. Totally different answers. It is. The, uh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, but it's, it's just, um, so the, uh, um, I would say probably 80% of our business is industrial. Um, so we, we just, I just went through a kind of a pretty full blown analysis of our business just to kind of get a better feel of where we were at okay. uh, at the end of last fiscal year. And I think it's just, it's just off memory, but general industrial, if you will. So that could be anybody from a, a guy who's making uh, lawnmower parts to hot tub parts to um, you name it, just general industrial. It's probably about 25% of our business. Uh, okay. About 20% of our business is aerospace uh, defense. And that's the private sector aerospace defense, like the Lockheeds and the Northrop Grumman's to the uh, public sector kind of aerospace defense to like we sell to China Lake uh, weapons to the Navy, to um, NASA, those, I consider those more of the public sector um, aerospace sure. defense types. Um, and then it goes into Semicon and EE and, you know, but in general, I would say about 80% of our, you know, 75 to 80% of our business, if I recall right, is B2B and then the other 25 or so percent is your guy who's, you know, got a couple printers or he wants, you know, you know, PLA, BS, PEG, PLA, you know, those kind of materials uh, is, a, is a smaller part, but still a very interesting part of our business. Okay, awesome. Yeah, thinking about kind of how, how you guys first started and because I don't see a lot of places where you can actually buy high-end materials. I had a suspicion that you mostly served kind of that more more industrial segment yeah but these guys you know so you know some of those big names that i mentioned they will they'll buy you know carbon fiber peak but they're doing a whole lot of prototyping in carbon fiber pla uh, they're doing really you know, yeah well they're going to pre-print make sure everything looks good with a 60 dollars a kg material make sure everything's set up the part looks great and then they'll go into the 400 dollars a kg material and, and make the part there's, okay. you know, there's those, those expensive 22 hour failures are kind of, uh, um, 
easier to stomach, if you will, when you when you uh, print them out of a little bit lower cost material. That uh, that makes a lot of sense. If I was mm-hmm. prototyping parts that were projected to be that expensive, I'd probably pick something a little bit cheaper to to start out with too. Yeah. Um, shifting gears for a second. Um, when did you start developing the three D printer that you guys offer? I think close to three years now. Okay. Yeah, we we developed it. Uh, yeah, it had to be at least three years now. Okay. And what made you kind of consider the jump from consumable materials into hardware, especially such high end hardware? From what I understand, do you have a question about three D printing? If so, I would love to answer it. Feel free to leave any questions in the comments down below or go to 3dprintauthority.com slash forms to submit your question. Thanks. Yeah, so these same, these same companies would come to us and say, hey, we, um, we really like your uh, material, your ESD Altam or your ESD Pack or you, you name it. Um, what printer do you recommend? And at that point, you're basically taking responsibility for everything. You're, you know, you're going to help them meet company X, um, or you're going to recommend to them two or three printers. But kind of, lo- kind of like my injection molding days when I was um, tech servicing our material at various uh, molders, I would walk into a plant and there would be a Van Dorn and a Cincinnati and a Kawaguchi and all these different injection molding machines. Um, and all the molds were hung in them were built by 15 different mold makers. But no matter what, the problem was always with our resin. You know, we picked the one bag of resin that was horrible and shipped it to this guy. It never had anything to do with his machine or his mold or the fact they didn't dry it. So, of course um, not. <laughs> yeah. So um, it's it's kind of the same way in filament, where you're living with the uh, the problems of the printer. You're living with the disconnect between the printer, the material, and the person. And so if you can kind of close that loop a little bit um, and make it a little bit tighter, the customer experience is better. They they don't. They don't really care about the printer. They don't want a printer. They just want a part. If you know, if they want a printer, then it's kind of the, they're missing the point. Um, so we were always living with kind of partial solutions and half measures to try to cobble together um, some relationship with a printer company where we could use our interesting material and their interesting printer, and the customer would get a part. And so we kind of we're in a you know me and a, my 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 uh, uh, business partner we. Um, kind of we're talking to one day and I said, you know, it's kind of like we're an interesting nail supplier in search of a decent hammer. And at the end of the day, if we're going to ever be able to answer that question appropriately, we're going to have to get in the business and make our own hammer. And so that's what we did. It's been about three years and we've got, you know, a lot of invested into that. Uh, we're about a month or two away from launching it. We're getting great looking parts. Um, and, um, you know, I'm pretty happy with everything that's, uh, that's going on over there on that side of the business right now. Gotcha. I want to touch on something in case anybody listening missed it. Um, in your own words, nobody wants a printer and they don't want a specific material. They want an end use part. And I think that's such a great insight and something that a lot of people uh, in the hobby space don't think about every day. Right. Um, when I look at printers, I very much look at like, all right, what do the mechanics look like? What's the build volume? How hot can I print? All these right. very technical things. Uh, but when you go into more like practical business applications, the end part is what matters more yeah. more than anything else. Yeah. Yeah. So that that's always been my experience is you need to, like the engineer who specifies your printer, um, other than losing a little bit of face and a lot of credibility if they made a mistake, you know, working with you, which we try not to have happen, um, it's usually not their money. It's usually their boss's money or their company's money, but it's their time and frustration. So when they have to show up to a meeting on Tuesday with a part or they have a deadline and your machine or your material is, 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 is um, caused them to be late or miss that deadline, you're kind of the problem now. Um, so they're really looking for just a part or a set of parts or some type of a manufacturing solution. And if they're spending a whole lot of time thinking about your printer, you've done something wrong. Or if they're thinking, you're, they're thinking something about you, too much time about your material, you've done something wrong. They just want their end part. Right. Absolutely. Um, thank you so much for, for kind of reiterating and touching on that. 
Um, because like I said, I think it's something really important for people to, to keep in mind. Um, when you look at this prayer, you've been developing it for, for three years. Um, what's it, what's it like? Are you using mostly, I'm going to say standard rep rap type materials? Um, are you using more high end Siemens controllers? Kind of what, what's it all gone into developing this printer? So yeah, it's, it's a, it's a, uh, it's all 100% high end. It's either custom or very custom, or you're close you know, to, to custom. What, what we did is when I first started this off, I lined up seven machines, um, and we basically, I wanted to take ideas and practices that these machines that I actually really liked to print with, and try to incorporate them into one machine. And so originally, um, you know, we had a Fortis, we had a bunch of Maker Gears, some Ultimakers. Um, I don't even remember anymore, but there's, there's parts of each of them that we've incorporated into this machine so that it kind of, it's user-friendly, it's, it's pretty automatic, um, but it, it, it really kind of encompasses um, a lot of the machines that I want to print with. And so we kind of laugh a little bit internally where we say, we're making printers for us, you can buy the ones we don't need, uh, because we really <laughs> are trying to build these for us um, that will want to use them. Uh, so the control systems, all high-end CNC type, Siemens type, but it's, it's actually a Skawa control system. Um, the, um, the chamber, it's fully enclosed, bellowed chamber that can get up to 225 Celsius um, for, you know, 60, 80, 150 hours. You know, it can hold the build environment at 225 C. Um, it's got a model and a support that can get up to 500 C on the extruder. Um, you know, so everything in the drivetrain is, uh, I believe it's um, D2 hardened steel. Um, so we're built it everything around carbon fiber. Um, it holds 16 kgs of filament on board in a heated okay. and dried um, chamber. So the, the chamber has got a desk and drying system, kind of like the resin dryers do out on our floor. It's got sure. desk and wheel technology in the back. So essentially, it's, it's, it's the printer that we've always wanted to be able to print our big parts with. And, um, you know, so it's, it's right now it's making some of the best looking all 10 parts I've ever seen. Gotcha. That's awesome. No, as you're, you're running through the specs, um, for people that might be listening that don't know D2 is an extremely hard, uh, steel that you're building this drive system out of, which is absolutely not the type of thing that you would see on a hobby level printer. No. Um, and even on very few, uh, I'd say prosumer, to industrial tier printers um so i'm geeking out a little bit thinking about you know how how nice the machine is built is it is it sourced in the united states do you source things from all over the world do you machine everything in house so everything is we're manufacturing and assembling here we're not bending steel or welding and okay. you know we're not we're not doing that but all of our vendors i'd say 95 percent, if you will of our vendors are all here in the u.s We've got okay. some offshore, but they're all, we have a, we have a democracy only policy. Um, so it's, um, and what I mean by that, you could be from Finland, I guess would be a socialist country, but they've, okay. they've determined their future. You know, they've, they've determined what they want to do. Um, so I don't mean that necessarily in terms of democracy, but in terms of self-determination. So all of our vendors, 100%, we have a, uh, a democracy only policy. So even if it's coming from Asia, it's coming from uh, countries that have self-determination. Um, it's kind of an important thing for, for me and my business partner. So um, there's some parts that we could have probably saved a few bucks on, but it's just not worth the, you know, the hassle and for, you know, deviating from that policy. So, yeah. Yeah. I think having, having values behind what you do is an incredibly important part of, of doing business and sticking to them, even if, you know, you might save a few bucks on some, some components. So I, I really admire that um, about you guys. Um, so that's launching within the next month, which is really exciting. Yeah. Um, if, uh, if you look at kind of where you've been, where do you see 3DX tech going in the next year or two? So we, you know, it's going to be hard not to have a, you know, the printer is about $100,000 and we have an ecosystem built around it, around filament dryers that are going to be um, auxiliary parts and then smaller and both larger printers. Once this launches and we get some traction, 
um, something a little bit smaller and something a little bit bigger. So we have a kind of an ecosystem on the roadmap, but um, it's going to be really kind of difficult for this not to be the tail that wags the dog, if you will, that okay. a lot of the effort's going to go behind um, sales and marketing the printer. Uh, but we really kind of just our focus right now is, is filling out that three-legged stool, if you will, the, um, okay. the, the materials, the printer, and the parts. So um, we're going to continue to, to grow towards uh, fulfilling all three of those. And, and we have a pretty good print business now. We've got a bunch of Ultimakers and Fortises and uh, Maker Gears and Zortrak. I mean, we've got your typical print shop <laughs> stuff, and we probably have 25 printers up there running. But um, every couple that go out the door, we'll get one delivered to our print service. A couple more go out the door to customers of these HT2s, we'll get one for our print service. So the goal is by the end of the year to have a really robust um, print service um, with printers that we've made that we're more familiar with, uh, that we have quite frankly our, our economics on, uh, coupled with our filament so that we can really have a nice uh, print service. Uh, when we talk to customers, I mean, there's a big automotive guy, I won't use his name, but you know, he's, he's been around for quite a long time in Detroit. Um, he's explaining to me earlier this year how he just needed, uh, how do I print this all temp stuff? And so we had a long conversation and what kind of printer do I need? And all these, he needed five parts. And it, not every day or every month or every week, he just needed five parts. So he sent me the file, I had it to him in three days. So some people just need parts, they don't care. Some people just need filament for their printers. We've got that. Some people want the entire solution, so we'll have that. So, um, you know, we really kind of see this next step is just re really solidifying those three legs if, of the strategy. Gotcha. Um, I think that that's a great reference and kind of a story to back up what you were saying previously, where people want the parts, they right. want the results, and a lot of times they don't care how they get it. If they get it quickly and cheaply, kind of within their within their constraints. So that's the B2B mentality. And that's kind of, you asked earlier about the difference between working with B2B and B2C. Uh, the B2B guys just want a part. And the B2C okay. guys are more intimate with their machines. They modified the heck out of them. Uh, they'll ask you 50 questions about something. And um, because they've used every material, they, you know, it's, it's just really kind of much more nuts and bolts for them. Whereas a lot of the B2B guys, they just want a part. This is what it's got to gotcha. do. This is uh, when I need it. This is the budget I've got. And, you know, so it's a different conversation. They're not, um, they're not really comparable. So based on, based on that, it seems like the, the selling parts business would be really important for you guys going for that, going forward. Is that something you'd agree with? Yeah. We see that, you know, the service side of the, of the business is actually one of our highest growth, uh, parts. Okay. Yeah. So we just started about a year ago that legitimately we had some, Customers that just needed parts, we had the printers, so yeah, we'll print them for you. But just in the last year, we actually started that as a, um, a business unit. And that hasn't taken too long at all to be self-sustaining and, and, and have positive growth. And so once we can, you know, if you can imagine our competition, if it bought a, you know, $150,000 Fortis, uh, Stratasys Fortis printer, and $700 can of Alta, and we can build our own HC2 and make our own role of Altem, it's not going to be terribly difficult for us to be competitive in that space. And so um, the same could be said for ABS or all, you know, Peak or, or any number of materials. Us being able to leverage our printer, our materials, and then all the engineers I have here, um, we're seeing that as, as a, a real big part of, of what our next couple of years is going to be. Gotcha. Yeah. I think, uh, I think you're hitting on something that um, Stratasys um, has managed their material supply and their hardware for years and years. I think you're discovering the, the much more attractive economics of being able to control all of those factors, as well as, I'm sure, part quality and, and oh, some yeah. other things. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, that's kind of what you said about ensuring part quality. So we're dealing with a lot of printer companies right now that source their printer or source their filament from third parties. They don't really control the inputs. Um, so it is kind of nice from a printing standpoint to be able to control your input. So, you know, you, you know, that whatever you've got coming in is good quality. Yeah. What, what I think is really impressive for me that I don't want to kind of reach the, the end of our time and not mention yeah, this. 
you're you're doing all of this in the United States, which I think is really really impressive because you're you're competing against some some massive um international companies um so i guess just kudos to you to to managing to pull that off and and be competitive is there anything that you can think of that really makes that possible do you want to be a guest on this podcast if so go to 3dprintauthority.com slash forms to apply thanks well, it's kind of, you know, it's, I guess one of the benefits is that we had an ongoing um, uh, profitable business that we grew the printer side out of. Okay. So if we were starting from scratch and wanted to make all these materials in this printer and this print farm and everything all, you know, from scratch, it'd be a whole different, I think, ball game. But but 3DX Tech's been around since 14. We've got a lot of customers, um, a lot of good materials from the PLAs up to the peaks. And so we, we're on, you know, on a positive track with respect to being able to fund a lot of these other projects. So it's been a little slower than what we wanted, you know, because COVID slowed everything down. But organically, we're growing. We haven't gone on the outside for any money. We haven't gone out on the outside for any, we haven't, you know, picked up any debt uh, from the outside. So um, things have been a little bit slower, but we've controlled what we want to do. And uh, I think within the next month or two, that's going to really start to pay off. Definitely, definitely. No venture capital, no debt, building organically and controlling your own destiny. I, I absolutely love it. Um, I missed one of my favorite questions at the very beginning, so I'm going to jump All back right. to it now. Um, I'd invite you to, to share something about yourself outside of 3d printing so the audience can get to know you a little better oh gosh um <laughs> yeah um let's see living grand rapids michigan beer country um couple of kids uh great kids son and daughter 17 and uh, 26 uh my uh, my son works for me he runs one of the businesses that we have um let's see love to ski was um Used to jump out of airplanes for a living. Is that kind of new and different? That is absolutely new you know? and different. Yeah. So my way <laughs> used to youth. jump out of airplanes for a living. Well, when I was in the army, you know, that's you know, yeah. Okay. Yeah, but that's a little that's a little <laughs> something from back in the way back. Um, but yeah, so it's just West Michigan, Grand Rapids. Uh, you know, I didn't grow up over here. I grew up on the other side of the state, but this is home. And you know, my kids are here, and every, you know, our whole business is here. So this is this is where we're uh, we're growing the business. That's awesome. I uh, I love it. Do you have a, a favorite brewery? <laughs> yeah, I, I could I could type it to you, but I don't want to I don't want to pick sides around here. Um, <laughs> I think I think Founders is probably a little bit more fun to go to and have some fun. They've got some great bands, but I think Bell's has probably got better beer. Um, and we've got Perrins, and you know, there's a whole. I mean, it's it's kind of beer mecca in West Michigan, but definitely, uh, you know, to be able to. Go to a bar and they ask you, you know, when when, when two hearted is your 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 fallback, you're like, oh, I guess I'll have a two hearted. Um, that's pretty spoiled. So, so yeah, I'm just kind of <laughs> thankful to to be here. I uh, I agree. I like Bells and uh, and Founders. Um, we're not gonna make any definitive <laughs> who's best statements because to your point, there's probably some uh, some rivalry there. Um, we've got one uh, one question left. Um, but before we, we get there, um, I'd invite you to uh, tell the audience where they can find you, where they can learn more about 3DX Tech, and if you have any special calls to action that you'd like them to take, now's, a, now's your time. Oh, great. Um, yeah, well, 3DXTech.com, you know, and uh, info at 3DXTech.com is always a great way to get a hold of us. Uh, we just launched a new website about a month ago. And it kind of pulls together the printer and the materials, I think, in a much better way. We've had a lot better feedback from our customers in the last month or so. Uh, trying to pull together a list of hundreds of materials between its their size, their colors, their types. Um, so far, the, the feedback from our customers is we've kind of you know done a much better job of pulling that off now than we have in the past. So definitely invite you to come out to the website um, to check out our materials and, and uh, check out some of the videos and the, uh, the pictures of the new printer. Awesome. Thanks, Matt. And then uh, the last question I have for you is outside of what you're doing at 3DX Tech, your products, 
Um, what's one thing that you're really excited about in 3D printing, whether that's a trend you're seeing, a specific technology, or just something you want to see more of in general? So again, it's kind of myopic. Everything right now has been focused on where we're at. But there's, you know, and one of my backgrounds kind of weird. Um, I've also got a patent law degree. And so we, I do a lot of the initial patent work and, internally and then send it out to someone who, you know, actually knows what they're doing. But um, the patent landscape's opening wide right now. So there's a lot of key things, not just something that happened to have just fallen off last month or so with respect to our friends at Stratasys. But in general, um, there's a lot of patents that are expiring that are going to open up innovation and actually change how we're doing things, not just on FDM, but there's some things going on in a lot of other technologies. But um, there will be more and more high temp printers, not just from 3DX tech, but from a number of good companies launching in the next uh, you know, six to 12 months because of some of these key patents. And that's really going to actually spur innovation. Um, so uh, I'm really looking forward to where these materials, the printers, and a lot of our customers are going to be able to go with these materials because it's just the tools that are going to be at their, um, their, at their fingertips now are going to be substantially better and, and in, in higher number than they were previously. So it's going to, it's going to lead to some really interesting times. Yeah. Um, thank you for bringing that up. I'm, I'm equally excited to kind of see, uh, some patents across printing technologies mm -hmm. expire and then see what. Uh, companies and new products get launched because of it, um, similar to, to what we saw when the core FDM patent yep. uh, ran up. So I think that's a that's a great insight. Um, thank you much, so much again for, for taking the time to talk to me, and uh, I'll look forward to connecting with you in the future. All right, great. Thanks for inviting me. Thank you so much for tuning in to listen to my chat with Matt from 3DX Tech. Make sure to check them out. I will put a link to their website in the description below. Make sure to check them out if you are looking for any high quality, maybe carbon filled filaments that are made in the United States. If you aren't already, make sure you subscribe to 3D Prince Authority wherever you might be watching or listening to this podcast. Until next time, happy printing.